So I want to transition to Heather and talk a little bit about optimal management of patients in the uh, uh, case of a diagnosis of an EGFR mutation. We've seen a change in the past decade since mm -hmm. these were first described. Yeah, and I think um, you know the first part of that answer links in with what you were just talking about. I mean, it's really critical to define what is the EGFR mutation. We've been having a run of exon 20s recently, mm -hmm. um, and so we are obviously we treat those differently than we would the more classical exon 19 deletion or L858R. And given the there's heterogeneity within even exon 20 mutations. Most are not very sensitive. Some patients can be, but because of that question in a first-line setting, I'm using chemotherapy first-line for the exon 20s, but we'll think about an EGFR TKI later for them. But for the exon 19 or the L858R, much more common, there we have very clear data now from multiple randomized phase three trials that those patients should be started with an EGFR TKI. The first uh, data was with gefitinib, and now we have data with erlotinib and data with afatinib. And so, uh, depending on where the, the viewer is, we don't have gefitinib in this country, but we have both erlotinib and afatinib approved um, as first-line treatment. Where there's been some more controversy recently is subdividing even further the deletion 19 from the L858R. Does that so, in influence your practice? Uh, it hasn't, but I know that it's it's certainly a matter of debate, and I think that uh, there's no question that if someone has an exon 19, every single study has been very clear that those patients are better treated with an EGFR TKI. There is debate over whether that should be erlotinib or afatinib. I, I personally still tend to use first-line erlotinib, um, and that's looking partway to what am I going to do next, and I think that afatinib especially in combination with cetuximab, can be very effective after erlotinib has um, stopped being effective, but the reverse isn't necessarily true, mm -hmm. though we haven't also necessarily ruled that out. So my preference is still erlotinib first line, better tolerated, patients are going to get a significant period of time with benefit and then can move on. But there is a there was a subset analysis that we've all seen that was presented at ASCO this year and I think was just published where um, the LuxLung 3 and LuxLung 6 studies, which were both in patients with known EGFR mutations, either deletion 19, L858R, either were randomized to get first-line chemo, and it was either with um, a platinum with gem or platinum with a fat, with um, pemetrexid on the two different studies versus a fatinib. And when they pooled that data together and looked at it, the patients with deletion 19 had an actual overall survival benefit, mm -hmm. which had not been seen in any of the other trials with the other agents um, with the afatinib if they had a deletion 19. But with the L858R data, it wasn't as clear. Right. And depending on how you look at that, you could even say, well, maybe the chemo was better. I am not going that far. I think our, we've had consistently strong data saying EGFR, TKI, first line in that setting. But it makes you wonder, and it kind of shows again that L858R and deletion 19 even aren't the same. Now, if you go back in time, there was some um, analysis done on the IPASS trial, the original Jafitnip study, also showing that deletion 19s did better than the L858R. So this isn't a new phenomenon, but when we saw it then, we didn't make a big deal about it. Now that it's come back again and with that overall survival part to it, right. there's questions. So the long-winded answer, right. um, my current practice is to still give first-line erlotinib, but I do talk about afatinib um, and um, have used it in a couple of patients. And I know that across the country, there are practices where afatinib is given always for the deletion 19s in the first-line setting since that data that's presented. You know, it's amazing to me that uh, these mutations were initially described in 2004, mm -hmm. and now we have at least eight randomized clinical trials showing improved response, of PFS, mm -hmm. now OS, uh, for an EGFR TKI versus chemotherapy in this setting. Uh, you know, I, I, I feel, you know, I often feel like the diagnosis of an EGFR mutation is like the old Y world of sports where you have the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. Mm -hmm. Because we know <laughs> on average about 9 to 12 months later we're dealing with resistance. Right. So there are two issues that I think uh, are worth discussing. One is the different patterns of progression that you might see in this population. And then uh, maybe I'll go back to Roy at this point uh, after Heather addresses that and really talk about what we know about the molecular basis of resistance in this population. So patterns of, of progression in this population? So there's um, quite a, a range of progression. Um, so some of the patients will have a very slow progression 
Um, and if it's in a, a one or two areas, there's certainly data to support localized therapy for that one region of progression. I can think of a couple of my own patients who had uh, growth, say, in a, in a lung mass, one I'm thinking of in particular, where we were able to do radiation, mm -hmm. and we're now a year and a half later, mm -hmm. and she doesn't have progression anywhere else. And so that's certainly one option. Some patients have a very rapid progression, at which point we definitely need to get a rebiopsy because those could be small cell transformations, mm -hmm. something we've been aware of for the last few years as a potential. Um, with the slower progression, with the rebiopsy, we can often find the T790M secondary resistance mutation, the gatekeeper mutation. Um, we find that about 60% of the time when we look for patients who have a progression after being on a first line EGFR TKI, and we'll, I think, probably branch into discussions about some of the newer drugs in that setting. But then there's a whole host of other resistance mechanisms which are less well established yeah. and less well sorted out as to what to do but where chemotherapy, chemotherapy can certainly play a role there. Do you think brain is a particular issue in this population, brain recurrence? Definitely. Yeah. Um, part of it is that as we know more about the driver mutations, know more about the drugs that work with the driver mutations, more of our patients are living longer. longer. Yeah. And as patients live longer, there's more opportunity for the malignant cells to get into the brain. Um, and so it's sort of the dreaded Leptomeningeal disease comes up with these patients, especially the four and five year survivors. Um, occasion, you know that we also can see that with with ALK and with any of the longer term survivors. That's always, you know, the dread that that's going right. to happen. So, Roy, molecular.